talks at the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Grinder Center CUNY in Midtown Manhattan, a slightly, slightly colder day again, it's overcast and um, and the city but shows so many signs of a recovery. The uh, cars are back on the street. We hear the honking people are uh, walking around. Just last night, I walked down uh, West, um, West Broadway um, and, um, and so many uh, uh, restaurants are open. Uh, people have happy faces, not full as we know the city, but there seems to be a sense of uh, an optimism um, in the city, but still, um, Almost every venue, performance venue, is closed. A very big difference to uh, Europe uh, and to other places around the world. Um, but it is a good place where we are in. And still, the questions we had throughout this year when we have the conversations about uh, someone said culture and Corona or arts and Corona and um, the time of Corona and what does it mean? Uh, uh, this big, uh, big uh, um, intervention that happened there. There will be a time before and after, and uh, we continue our talks. We started out with theater artists from around the world, and we had some also great and significant talks with the new situation in Chile, which is so stunningly uh, um, uh, surprising. Well, there people will work on a new constitution. Theater people have been part of that incredible success in the elections. The constitution since the time of Pinochet will be will be a change. On the other hand, we hear these devastating news from India, our theater colleagues who are up all night trying to connect people to hospital beds. It's never been as bad in the history of that young state. Um, so uh, we are really getting an overview. And now we have with us uh, a great worker uh, in the field, in the vineyard of theater, Fergus Linehan, who is the director of the Edinburgh Festival, the International Festival. Hi there, where are you and uh, what time is it? Um, it is five o'clock in the evening and I am in a room with no windows in Edinburgh where I've been pretty much for the last 15 months. With a couple of let me out, they let me out occasionally. Yeah, it looks like the sun is shining on you, so I'm surprised there's uh, no window, but at five o'clock uh, uh, it might also already be a little bit closer to, to um, sunset. It's uh, so great to have you with us. Um, the Edinburgh Festival, together with the Berlin Festspiele, the Wiener Festival, and the Avignon Festival, uh, Theatre d'Avignon, Theatre der Welt, and I apologize to everybody I leave out, the uh, Next Wave Festival at, at BAM. And it's one of the great, important, inspiring festivals, also founded after World War II in 1947. I hope we talk about this, also what it means, that idea of a Festspiele celebration of a town of life, art, and, um, and uh, they're in the middle of uh, preparing for it, of the opening, not opening, how to show things, how not. And it's a big festival. It's an important festival, something you don't play around with. So we'll do it next year. Let's see. Uh, and uh, it's such a great, great history. So we're going to hear something um, from uh, a place we all know about, but actually we do not get so many news. We don't know what's happening. What is the situation? How is the situation in Scotland anyway compared to a great but in the uk to 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 europe and um and the world so um, i want to thank also joe malillo great joe malillo who uh, made the connections that we have to talk uh, to fergus this is important and, and he also said i would like to know what the hell is going on there and uh, so fergus what is going on what, what's on your mind what about the festival well Obviously, last year, we normally launch our program in March um, and we were we had our brochures in our hands. We were ready to go. And that was obviously when everything changed. And I guess for those of you who have, don't really know the way it works in Edinburgh, we're a kind of family of festivals. So there's the International Festival, which was the original mm -hmm. festival and it's curated, invited festival. There's one of the biggest book festivals in the world. There's the military tattoo, which takes place in the castle every night. Um, there's an art festival. And then, of course, there's the enormous fringe festival, which anyone can come along to and pay their own way and take their chances. So it's, it's not it would be it would be a big deal if it was just us. But actually, there's so many more parts to it. But we all came together at the beginning of April last year and realized that we weren't going to be able to go ahead. So, so nothing happened. none of the festival, none of the festivals showed anything we, we, we most of us did online projects 
um, but they were strictly online. There was no live element to them. Um, and of course, as we know, different art forms are easier to do. So the book festival just went on and the book festival had discussions with authors, which translated really well online. Um, other areas were also very successful, but you know, not, not as successful. And I think this is one of the things we've been learning about is what works and what doesn't in the digital form. So there was there was quite a strong digital program, but no, nothing live. So just now we are in the process of launching our 2021 program, which we did today. Um, today? And Incredible. Yes, because we did it this of our morning. Pseudo talks, I hope. <laughs> yes, we planned yes. it all. Oh, yes, because of this, this talk. Um, so we we've just done this obviously months later than we normally would. Um, the fringe is still really trying to find its way because we still have got what a, a two meter social distancing requirement between people in auditorium, which means, for example, our 1800 seat opera house can hold 370 people. So we're trying to work our way around that, which is for us and we've got donors and and stakeholder government support. We're managing to do that. For the fringe which has to operate in some kind of commercial way it just is looking incredibly difficult the tattoo which is huge cancelled two weeks ago so at the moment it's us it's the book festival it's the art festival and parts of the fringe are coming together but it's still very unclear as to which parts they will be so we've got a real shifting sort of situation here because obviously our vaccination rate is fantastic um and so things were getting much better but the question with this new variant means that things are slowing down and we can still see an exit route from it but whether or not where the exit route is going to be on the 7th of august when we begin is very complicated mm -hmm. and also even more complicated what are the travel restrictions going to be because it looked like we were just going to have a really low incidence of, of COVID in the community, which meant that the UK would be a place people would be very comfortable coming and going mm. from. But now it's not even so much about that. It's where are the variants? So the variants, you mean the Indian one? You're, the, the yeah, one the, 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 in particular, the, that, the Indian one. But you know, who knows what else is around the corner? But this is the thing. I think, I think we were purely thinking, as long as we're vaccinated, as long as the incidents are low, we will be able to bring artists in. And there was, in fact, an exemption from quarantine for artists in the UK before Christmas. That has been suspended. How so, is the situation? England, uh, UK, uh, Scotland, Ireland, all of it. We, it's, we don't know enough. What, well, how is this for you locally? Well, the health is what they call a devolved area. So health is resp the responsibility of the individual nations within the UK. So Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales and England will have their own health policies although they do try to match them up to a degree. Things like, you know, which countries can come and go, those tend to be across the UK. But Scotland has taken probably a harder line and a more strict line than England. So in England, some venues are up to almost 50% capacity, and they had an ambition to be back at full capacity by the 21st of June. That doesn't look like it's going to happen now. No. Um, but we haven't had really meaningful live performance in Scotland since the 22nd of March 2020. So we're a long way back um, and we had hoped that by the 7th of August the performing arts would be very much back and people would have been going to concerts for many, many weeks. It's now looking like August is possibly going to be the pioneering month. That's going to be when people are just coming back. So. Um, unfortunately for us, we, we, we are the ones who sort of ended up looking like we're the ones who are going to be, be pioneering a lot of the protocols and, and things like that. So we've tried to work in a way that will mitigate against cancellation. So rather than just saying, we'll go back into our theatres, we'll be at full capacity, we've actually built a whole range of outdoor, um, sort of indoor-outdoor venues um, with social distancing so that you know, if things get really disastrous, we wouldn't be able to go ahead. But if things are, are relatively OK, but not brilliant, we can still go ahead. So if I understand right, you created covered outdoor venues. I heard also from our talk with Theater de Welt, uh, they did something like this in front of a, a, a theater. 
it got published this morning. It's really true. The program you announced it. I, I, I'm, I saw a little bit of it. Maybe you can share a bit. How does it? How does the festival look like? How does your brochure look like in a time of uh, Corona? If it's easy for you. Well, it's. Can we have I a mean, look at the? Sure. I'll give you a look. Later? I'll give. I'll give you a quick look at um, the. Um, you can just see it here. Um, I might. I might just actually give you a quick look at um, a sense of, of well, certainly the atmosphere we're trying to give out, which is a video that we just put out this morning to give a, a kind okay. of sense of how important it is for for Edinburgh, and then I might go back and just give you a look at a couple of, okay. of the venues themselves. So this is just to give you a a, a mood, a sense of the moods that we're we're hoping to be able to, to present. Everybody misses it and really missed it last year. It just felt really, really strange. That is the main thing that will make life feel normal again. August every year, it's such a good feeling. It's just amazing to have this on our doorstep. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited for the festival this year make us laugh or make us our hearts leap and make us sing with joy. It's that, that being together is such a key thing and that's what the Edinburgh International Festival does. So yeah, I mean, as you sort of gather from that, it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite an emotional thing for this yeah. city to have lost its festival um, and it, it's, it's not it's not a peripheral thing, and the arts aren't a peripheral thing in any sense in this city. So it's um, it's something that I think is is incredibly important. So, I mean, as I was saying, I'll just um, share my desktop there and give you a quick sense of of the sort of. So this is the sort of venue that we're going to create. Um, this is in kind of an old college quad area, and. We've this got, is new. What would we look at? Didn't exist. Yeah, the, the actual the structure, the structure where we are we're constructing all of this for August. So no, we've never we've never done this before. So it's um, it's an adventure. But yeah, this gives you a sense, and you can sort of see these are larger ones. Um, but we do have to do this social distancing. Um, so um, I think what what you end up with is obviously a very particular type of of performance. So. The, the sort of the concert structure or the spoken word structure um, or being able to do opera in concert or musicals in concert. But that really is, it, it sort of pushes us into that area. I mean, we are going into some theaters as well and doing some, some full production. Why new structures and why not just the existing variety, the great variety you actually have of theaters? Because I think if we go indoors, those venues can get categorized as being kind of outdoors. And this is one of the big categorizations for us is once you go indoors, the numbers become very small. Um, and also, mm. if we were, to, if things were to get a little bit worse, we would risk being cancelled a lot more if we were if we were indoors rather than outdoors. Sure. So, so we're trying not to have too much of the festival that would get cancelled if we did happen to slip backwards a little bit. Incredible. So it's to say, actually, in the time of Corona, new spaces are emerging, public spaces that were already out there. But I think also like in, I think in the um, um, festivals in Canada, the uh, Transamerique, where lots of jazz things happen outside, they create something. Um, also in Germany and other places, you create new, new places. For our listeners also, um, Edinburgh, like, um, in a way, like Avignon, it's a town where really the identity of a city is connected to the performing arts. It is not often, in America, often it's sports or cars uh, or it is a digital uh, media companies, you know, but it is a town where the identity of a city is connected and it was taken away and now it is coming back. It's imp really important uh, decisions it's, it's you really make. It's pioneering, as you say, yeah. In, in a very practical way as well, you know, I mean, 
a big part of the economy of the city is connected into it. Um, and also because we're, you know, we're a medium sized city, we're half a million people, but we have a major university, we have a major finance center. So I think Edinburgh has always seen itself as a world city going right back to the days of the enlightenment. So that connection with the, with the kind of a, a global view is something that the city holds very dear and the festival feeds into that. But the festivals themselves are worth about 300 million pounds to the city every year. So it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, even if you don't like the festivals, there, <laughs> and most people do, but it, it has what? a very tangible sense of, of kind of commercial day-to-day -day importance in people's lives as well as culturally. Yeah, an important lesson to everybody who also questions the value of art. It shouldn't be measured just by this, but actually it has an incredible value. Maybe tell us a little bit, and I don't know enough about you. Why is it Edinburgh after 1947? Why not Glasgow? Even Edinburgh is more famous for its festival, at least here in the theatre community, than London or other places. So why Edinburgh? What happened? Why did it become such a significant piece of uh, identity in global theatre? I mean, there's, there's obviously in 47, around that time, 47, 48, that was the emergence of so many of Europe's festivals. So that's when Avignon happened. That's when uh, Aix-en-Provence happened. That's when Holland Festival happened. But there was a particular model, which you could say was, was around Aix-en-Provence and Avignon, maybe even Cannes, which is a smaller city that is walkable, that is historically very interesting, um, and had access to a much larger city, which might have been London. Um, and so Edinburgh really fitted that mold. There were brutally practical things like Edinburgh wasn't bombed in the Second World War, so our theatres were all intact. Um, I think, though, I do think, you know, why do certain cities embrace it? And I do think Edinburgh embraced it because it always saw itself as kind of intellectually and socially uh, a world city. Um, and so therefore was was willing to invest. And, um, you know, I often I often think that festivals succeed when they reflect back on the population, something that they'd like to see. Um, and if they if the if the festival reflects back something that they don't feel is is part of their identity, well then it just doesn't work. It never holds. Mm -hmm. And it's the collection of festivals. There's a very social side to it, but there's a kind of an intellectually rigorous side to it, and there is just just fun as well. So between the festivals, I think it does reflect back on the city something that they was believe. It always in, was it always international? What is right to well called Edinburgh International Festival? Yeah, and, and that was always its intention, even though, you know, international in 1947 meant the Western canon, you know, international. So what, meant... How did it happen, the first one? Did someone, was there one curator or companies got together or yeah, it was... the mayor said, do something? What happened? It was um, actually, it was Glyndebourne Opera were really looking for a season outside of Glyndebourne. And Glyndebourne is a very famous country estate where there's opera every year. Um, and their artistic director, who was Rudolf Bing, who went on to run the Metropolitan Opera in New York, um, came to Edinburgh and they felt that this was a good place and presented it to the sort of city council as an idea. Um, and so it was, I mean, put together against incredible odds. There were no hotels. It had been a period of complete blackout. Um, and so the great kind of programming moment, and Rudolf Bing was himself a refugee from wartime Europe, and he brought Bruno Walter, the conductor, back together again mm -hmm. with the Vienna Philharmonic, who'd been separated. And so I think it was seen very much as a European project. And it was seen as, and I, I think the reason all these festivals sprung up around Europe was because we needed celebrations, but it didn't feel appropriate that there would be national celebrations or religious celebrations. So we needed to find what was what was a secular celebration that we could have that would reunite. And I think within Europe, it was it was thought well the European canon, you know. So I mean, we're talking about you know Shakespeare and Beethoven and, and that canon, um, which would be a wouldn't be the definition we'd have of international now. But at that time, it was it was it was sharing that which we had in common, and so therefore you could have institutions like the Vienna Philharmonic, which were highly associated with you know the Nazi Party, and you know Jewish conductors who had had to flee, and it was an act of of, of reconciliation, and so it had a 
it had a very serious side to it. Um, and and I think that that's one of the reasons it survived is because it's kind of foundation story is so strong. Yeah, it, it struck me also in the video, the message coming together, you know, having a place to get together. Um, is that uh, something that's reinforcing, rediscovering? Has it always been like this? Or are you rethinking, have you been rethinking that year you spent in your windowless office? Um, uh, I don't know if you look at Microsoft window, but your windowless <laughs> office is, is might be a window, but it's not a real one. But anyway, w are you rethinking, were you rethinking the idea of the festival? I mean, just I think, how we get back? I think, yes, how we get back. I think, you know, the thing about festivals is, that, you know, you've got an art festival and part of it is the art and part of it is the festival. And, um, you know, I remember being down in Avignon a couple of years ago and meeting someone who's, you know, quite senior in the art. And I sort of said, so what are you going to? And they said, oh, I'm not going to anything. I'm here because everyone is here. I'm here for the discussion. And, and not just for the fun of it, but that, you know, it is what happens in a festival is, is what happens on stage is important, but what happens around that and the, the gathering of people. And the thing about Edinburgh is because we have everything from, you know, a 17-year-old stand-up comedian going on stage for the first time upstairs in a bar through to, you know, something by Eva van Hove or something, you have everyone. You have, every, you have music, you have film and television, you have the entire performing arts. And so the gathering is, is absolutely critical. And, you know, the thing I've felt most keenly in the last while is just the absence of, of the voice of the audience. Um, and so for me, the, you know, because we could have gone digital this year and it's an awful, it's a huge effort to get back to live, but I feel that we, we, we as a festival, they get the gathering of people is, is all the more critical. And, you know, obviously that goes for, for Christmas and Hanukkah and all festivals, the gathering is as important as anything else. So, um, I mean, I think that's the thing I've been thinking a lot about through lockdown is, you know, we're constantly running around thinking about how do we put productions together and who's going to be in them and who's going to direct them. But how people gather and when they gather and where they gather is is just as important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that the great Gertrude Stein said, you know, early on, how about theatre is just people get together, making, you know, calling each other, let's meet then, have something to eat before, after look at the play, discuss it, but then come back to their own life. But it provides um, um, uh, a context, you know, of a social, as you say, gathering, it's important, but also to exchange ideas. H how do you um, balance the idea of art, of presenting great art in a moment of great, at least in the US, social crisis, political crisis, and the idea of kind of, yeah, now as you say, it's commercially also important for the city, the tourism, you know, um, there's what one should, good reason. Entertainment, American theater is so highly commercial. The entertainment, you know, is so so important. Let's see Berlin theater, the reflection about it is so important. And if people laugh, sometimes it might be suspicious, you know, it changed a little bit. But so how do you balance that? And what do you think is of importance now? Well, I mean, the two are, I think they're interchangeable. I mean, it's, what was that great Peter Brook quote? He said, you know, at the end of the day, theatres have to be full. And he said it's um, that it's, it's, but they have to be filled honourably. And he said it's easy to, um, it's easy to fill a theatre dishonourably, but it's even easier to empty it honourably. So, you know, we have to, mm -hmm. we always have to, we always have to find that we can't assume or, or presume the interest and engagement of the public. Um, so, feeling connected into the public and into the zeitgeist and having a conversation with what people are engaged and interested in isn't necessarily commercial and you know so i think that some of the most radical political work is you know you see it with Beyonce on the stage at Coachella, you know, it's which which in its own way is utterly commercial as well. So I think it's a it's a false dichotomy to think that over here is art and over here is commercial, or that you know it is 
it is in some way kind of purer to be just engaged with a smaller audience. So, um, I, so I think that it's 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 the the reality is as you kind of have in the theatre is, you know, we've all done shows in tiny venues and um, perhaps you know we've done shows we've had the privilege of doing shows in big venues as well, but it's kind of understanding it as a as an ecosystem and understanding that the public moves between things. They don't just exist in, in one realm. And, um, and sometimes they do just want to go out and have some fun and dance and have something that isn't, isn't that sort of necessarily as pointedly um, political or about aesthetics. And other times they do. And I think within a festival, because you're programming in a very intense period of time, you've got to realize that people need kind of to come to one thing and then go to something else. And so you, you just need to, to figure out what their journey through it is going to be. Um, and sometimes being in a big crowd in that way is, is kind of thrilling. I mean, the, the issues around commerciality are very real. And I think that perhaps even less than with the public, I think it's more real in terms of monies that might need to be generated in terms of say sponsorship or donations or indeed government. Um, so one of the things I think is, uh, if you're working on something that is bigger, you probably have more agendas to work with. Um, you know, people are supporting you to a certain level, as you say, perhaps because perhaps the government is supporting you because they like the effect it has on tourism. And so therefore you do need to deliver those things. And, um, and it's one of the, one of the challenges I think is, is a way of looking at all of those agendas, but not being kind of ruled by them. Um, but being respectful toward them. And I think when you're in a city that isn't huge, like Edinburgh, and you're doing an event like this, which is really large, you have to realize that there are many people with strong opinions about what you should be yeah. doing. Um, are you expecting tourists? I mean, if, let's say August works out. Yeah. Um, are you encouraging people to come say, yes, you, our, our business is open and... Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we're not. Do you we're not. Think it will be for the city a bit more. Yeah, I, I do. I do. I mean, the city is incredibly engaged. Sixty percent of our audience comes from the city anyway. Um, well, there's two things we say. First of all, we've far less tickets this year, so we may not be able to offer. Well, I think the thing at the moment is we're not discouraging people, but there's no, I think, um, campaign at the moment within Scotland to say to people now is the time to come to Scotland because there's still so much, so much uncertainty. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've done festivals elsewhere, which were purely funded by a kind of a tourism department within government. Mm. Sometimes you will draw upon funds which are very specifically about doing a certain type of work. So there's a certain kind of real politic about that. But at the same time, people want a kind of a, a clear curatorial line running through things. But you know, that's, yeah. that's just the reality of of, of yeah. being a producer and a presenter. And to tell a little bit the audience about you, you know, you have been the director of the Edinburgh International Fest Plus and now for uh, starting in 2015. So it's seven years, the famous uh, seven years, and, and they have been very popular and critically acclaimed. And he brought renowned directors, choreographers and companies uh, and expanded the reach of the festival. And, uh, and the expanding, I think, what you said, were the, at, actually the foundational most the music uh, uh, programs and um, and programs like uh, uh, you are here and uh, environmental social and political issues became a bit more the forefront than perhaps before and as a history you're from ireland uh, um, and uh, you worked at the dublin theater festival the big Dub great dublin theater festival you served as the chief executive and artistic director of sydney festival very important in australia and uh, at the head of the music, the Sydney Opera House, and uh, the festival director of Vivid Live. Um, all your experiences put together, is there, can one say, is there something Scottish about the festival, or do you think it's really truly an international festival? No, I think it's very Scottish in lots of ways. What's Scottish about it? Um, I think the tone of it is very Scottish. I think that it's. Um, I think we, you know, I, I talk about all the agendas that are at play, and yet I still think we've got an incredible freedom to be kind of rigorous about what we do. Um, 
also we always have a really good strong lineup of Scottish artists um, and mm -hmm. so that is that is yeah. always going to be there we all live and work and send our children to school here so we're, we're very very much part of the community here and um, you know we have things like our own festival chorus which goes along all year so we feel utterly of the city um, and so I, I kind of um, even though so many visitors come in it's also hard to explain just how strongly people are connected in in terms of their own participation it's not just a, a tourist moment it's a moment where there's many people who say to me it's the reason I live in Edinburgh or one of the very strong reasons I live in Edinburgh so um so it's a it's just it feels like something and it's one of the great privileges of it yeah, I think really sometimes in the arts sometimes in the arts you can feel a little bit you know that you're in involved in something that's marginalized in some way you never feel marginalized in any way um you know when you say to people this is what I do they always want to know and they've always been to something and so mm -hmm. it's um it's it's an incredible privilege I've never I've never known that anywhere else yeah I mean I, you're right I looked also at the brochure that you know the Scottish the national orchestras are part of it so many local artists it's quite mm -hmm. different and yet on the same it's very open very international if i saw it right you have people from russia brazil ireland uh, not so far away but still uh, uh, cairo um, gambia um, some very big names alan cumming who we know well also here in new york and it's like club alan and yet we and, and, and the singer simon rattle Rene fleming thomas Quastoff. so you have a you have a, a mixture of something truly local in a way also global um of the new things you put in i saw things like walks uh park works work in the park i think it's called uh um how was it edinburgh park um a toast to people uh field you know the outside so tell us a bit what what are you doing there that might be what are your new in inventions in the festival i mean i think that this year what we've had to look at are ways of presenting performance that we that, that that can have the can work within the parameters of of the protocols and there are incredibly rich areas such as you know spoken word and slam poetry and you know poetry and performance so we take something like that and then we're matching up various artists so people like Saul Williams from the US or Inua Elms from the UK um, and and looking at that as an area and matching them up again it's thinking about the concert platform but then we always do these huge events which are kind of tens of thousands of people shoulder to shoulder um big free events and so we've had to reinvent that as kind of as walk through different parts of the city so we're a company called our bots we're creating these fire sculptures and we'll create a musical walk through our botanic gardens um Similarly, we have a Fire we have a piece. And a yeah, very walk. tell us a bit. Well, it's our beautiful botanic gardens here. And so what they do is they create these these huge sculptures all around the gardens and into the water. And 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 we create a musical score as you walk through. So it's that idea of having to take the idea of an audience as opposed to it being a static thing to it moving, and therefore we can start to get the sort of numbers we need. We have another piece by um, um, a Scottish Egyptian writer called Sarah Shwari, which is you put headphones on and you walk around and that's actually about um, it's about the Arab Spring and things that happened in Cairo. But again, it's it's finding a way to get get the audience out. We have another piece in a, in a big field at the bottom of the crags, which is the big mountain in the city, which is a time based choreography. So we're we're looking at that and anyone can come and go. And then, of course, we've had to internationally, we've had to create missions because we can't have the companies come here. So they've created special ones. So people like Gregory Makoma from Soweto and Omar Raja from Beirut and Alice Ripo from Brazil, they've all created work with their companies from their lockdown locations, which are kind of choreographic essays that they're sending over. So, yeah, we've had to. We've had to kind of be thinking a lot about how we can do things. And then even when we go inside, creating things that are effectively rehearsed readings so we don't have to spend too much time. Um, and then, of course, the other big part of it is because so many people can't come, we really need to have a really generous streaming 
um, offer for free. So, and this is one of the things, it's sort of everything seems to be just a technicality at the moment, but the conversations with companies now, the initial conversations always start with, yes, can we do the presentation? And how are we going to work out the rights for streaming? And how are we going to work out the logistics for that and the camera positions for that? As opposed to that being an afterthought when seasons are released and then you do it, that's there at the beginning. And people are far less suspicious of that. I think people were always worried about that um, and the controlling about it, whereas everyone knows that's just something we all have to do now. So if we're doing a play, we have to go, okay, how are we going to capture it? When are we going to do Who are which, which media company are we going to partner with, whether it's the BBC or whoever else? How are we going to do that? So yeah it's 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 a different way of thinking and i think well, certainly the digital one is going to be the great the great legacy at the end of this mm -hmm. and you feel let's say by america <clears throat> everything will be fine next year you can do whatever you want the digital inventions or just it will stay well yeah i mean i think that so many artists who were in who were in the performing arts and in the theater and music have had to consider this. And it has been, you know, for, for directors and for artists, I can't imagine that they're gonna let that go having moved so far into it. Um, and I don't think it, it's, we, we've quite seen how it'll manifest itself yet. But um, I think that, you know, one of the things for me was I guess growing up you saw so much performing arts on television. So whether it was Leonard Bernstein kind of doing his lectures about classical mm -hmm. music or, yeah. or, or, or plays on television, and then bit by bit, all of that started to disappear off terrestrial TV. Whereas now we've kind of found a way to bring it back, not in terrestrial TV, um, but, but, but online or through other, through different mm -hmm. platforms. So it's kind of almost a reintroduction of the performing arts back onto screens rather than it being brand new. Um, but it's got incredible, incredible potential within it, I think, both, both in terms of work in and of itself that's valuable and just bringing people, breaking down some of the barriers that exist. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. There's an interesting thought to say. It's actually a reoccurrence of something what was strong, especially, I think, on the BBC with the master of these theaters and all of it and uh, and um, that it is um, uh, uh, kind of reinvented in a in a new um, a new form for you um you, you come from a theater family in a way your mother is such a highly respected actress uh, in ireland your father i think also was an art critic connected to the arts um often uh, you know the butcher's uh, son doesn't want to run the butcher store or uh, you know and the shoemaker's daughter doesn't want to wear shoes um and uh, why do you believe in art? Why do you say I dedicate my life energy? I do that. Why do you think it's this important? Why do you do it? What makes you work through the 15 uh, months in a windowless office? Um, well, this, this, this wasn't the plan. <laughs> I didn't choose this. But, but you did it. But you did I it. Did. I did. I mean, I think that you're right. You know, I mean, I often think that the people I meet in the arts often did something that was seen as very radical by their families. You know, they went off and they did this crazy thing, whereas I just went into the family business. I, I did it in a very, very conventional way. Um, I think I had a big, I won, a great advantage I had was my, my parents were involved in comedy a lot when I was growing up. My mother was a comedian and then she, was a, she became a straight actress, if you want to call it that. Um, my father was a film critic. And so when we were growing up, there really was kind of, you know, Paul Porter was on one minute and then Mahler was on the next. And my parents were involved at the end of the kind of variety world in the UK. So I was very familiar with that and pantomime. And, and so I think it was something that became very ordinary to me. Um, and I feel that then when, as I kind of got older and I came out into the world, I sort of found that there were all these distinctions and that people who liked this didn't like that. Um, and of course, there's still the question of quality and you can have someone who's an old variety store, or sort of star, who's a genius, 
and um, and that work can be incredible. And then, of course, you can have a Shakespearean actor who's incredible. Um, but I didn't understand that distinction. And I think I've always just truly believed it makes, it makes your life better and not in any um, terribly abstract way. It just, it, just, it just means you're kind of engaged with the world and you're engaged with your society and you're engaged. And so I've always felt, I've never even had kind of any doubt. I've never really had to <laughs> think about it too deeply because everywhere I've seen where culture is valued and invested in, the place gets better. And everywhere I kind of want to go in the world, it's because it's culturally rich in different ways, in completely different ways. Um, so I, I've kind of, I, I think you've got to take quite a long view on it. And I think it's one of the things that Edinburgh is very good at is, you know, this festival has been around for 75 years. It takes a while, but um, I, I guess I've never really had any doubt about it. I think that, and one of the things I guess I found really interesting is just being able to take this idea of, um, of, of culture being available across so many different forms and being respected across so many different forms and then bringing that to the work. Um, and it isn't an either or. And sometimes when you're, particularly if you're dealing with something like classical music, there's a sort of a fear within classical music that, you know, if popular music comes in, it will replace it, you know? Um, and of course it doesn't, it's just a, a general respect for music. I think the other thing is I just grew up really respecting artists. I kind of, you know, people like me get to talk on things like this, but you know, when, when the lights go down, we will all be cowering in the shadows <laughs> and the artists have to step forward. And, you know, it's like that, you know, Susan Sontag line of the three things artists need, you know, support, support and support, you know, and it, it, it is that it's kind of that I think, I think it's a very noble kind of um, profession to support artists. Um, I, I'm, I am truly in awe of them, maybe too much at times, um, but, but I think they've an incredibly important role in society. And, you know, there were many things wrong with Ireland when I was growing up, but one of the things that the government did was they made all royalties tax free because it was an acknowledgement that the artist was particularly important. And I just found that any place that I liked and any place where I found I was a society that I liked, it was just a fundamental respect for the artist. And that might be pop stars, or it might be actors, or it might be writers, but fundamentally they understood that that was a really important person in the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess a, a festival like you, that you know, adds to, you know, uh, creating that respect, you know, for them, and, but also serving in the city. But let's talk about Edinburgh. If it's 75 years, you have that great festival. How, how did it impact? I know there's also poverty, let's say, next to what could say the digital poverty that not everybody can get now to the online um, offerings. But um, how, how did it impact the city? Do, uh, are there studies and uh, next you know, to what we normally say, why it's important, and we know it. But do you, that, is there a feeling that that festival has made the city a better city, or what you said. About. I mean, I think there is. I mean, if one's to be honest, you know, any any city needs to be will have kind of things that are strong, and there there are challenges that get thrown up by a really powerful festival within a city as well, which is you know what happens the other eleven months of the year, and is there too much attention given to to this period, or too much kind of resource given to it. And so I think it is, it is incredibly enriching for the city. And one of the things you get, of course, is you get a really sophisticated audience because if you've grown up in Edinburgh, you know, you've seen the greatest artists in the world. Like if you, most cities of the size of Edinburgh, you know, something might tour by, you know, a touring musical or a touring play, and you might have a, a decent rep company. Um, but you don't have, you know, the giants of the performing arts coming and, you know, performing down the road from you every year. So the audience itself is, becomes incredibly um, enthusiastic and sophisticated. Um, so that's really important. But you do have to be careful because 
you know, there, there's, you know, you have to consider what about the artists who live here and um, what about the, the need to ensure that the person who's living and creating here for the other 12, 11 months of the year is, is properly resourced um, and that you don't, I think it's a particular conversation at the moment about because over the last 20 years there's been such in emphasis about the arts being used for tourism or economic development or economic regeneration, that you build your cultural infrastructure on that basis, but it doesn't actually suit the people who live there or the artists who live there. It's just good for visitors. And, you know, so you might have some gorgeous building like the Guggenheim in Bilbao um, and everyone goes, isn't that fantastic? And look how many cafes and that. But, you know, you've got to ask, is that exactly what the people of Bilbao wanted? <laughs> no. um, mm -hmm. And I think that's that's a big question at the moment. And um, particularly we run questions of sustainability and, and tourism and, and perhaps even over tourism. I think there's a lot of questions about using those economic metrics to drive cultural policy um, might in land you with a kind of a cultural kind of landscape that doesn't actually suit the people who live in the place. Now, I'm not saying that happens in Edinburgh, but it's something we've got to really guard against. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's uh, that is I think some of the lessons of COVID, the community, the sustainability, the accessibility. And I think I heard in another interview uh, with you, you, you commented on it that a company, an artist should have an impact also on the community. That actually it's important. And if we look back on the history of theater, um, I think you also mentioned that the Ballet Russe, when they came to Paris, things changed. Uh, when Moscow Art Theater came to New York, it was a shock, that ensemble to see. Uh, the Bodino Ensemble uh, touring the world, especially Britain and or the UK, things changed. Pina Bausch's great work, and, we hope we have a company with us maybe next week. Um, something changed. Um, are you thinking um, what many people are saying? Maybe we have to go back away from the kind of flying in the stars and the international festivals, looking a little bit alike. I think something you very well avoided, very well done with your local rootedness. And, um, but um, still, that idea of engaging with the local in a, in a global way. I, I, is this something that you feel stronger about or less, or do you think we all, you have already done that? Or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I've got to be, you know, I think I've got to be careful with this as well, though, because, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful that I did get to see Bina Bausch and the Moscow Art Theater <laughs> and the Berlin Ensemble. And I do think it's important for people to, and, you know, they may not even like them, but, you know, the truth is the nature of theatre in particular requires you to be present. And, um, and so I think it's, I think it is important. But I think what we've got to think about is, you know, the days when someone would fly in, go to the theatre, do some work, do their performance and then straight out to the airport again. And that has been accelerating. And I think we need to think about that. And so particularly for sustainability reasons, I, I feel I feel visits need to be longer and they need to have more local impact. I think that a visit, particularly with a large company traveling from a great distance, it needs to have an impact both on the company and on the place that they've been. Um, I, I simply don't think that the days when we can just go, you know, we're playing Tokyo tonight and Edinburgh tomorrow and, and Los Angeles the following day. I think, you know, I'm being facetious with that, but I think, I don't think that that is going to be sustainable in any way. Um, so, I mean, one of the things of 22 we're looking at is, okay, so if, if we had less companies doing more work for longer, what would that look like? Um, and it's actually, it's triggered some really interesting questions because, for example, we're having a conversation with an American orchestra and rather than saying in you come with your principal conductor and you'll do a concert and then off you go. It's a question of, OK, if you stay for a week. First of all, what have you got to say about your city? You're not just coming in and doing a Brahms, Brahms symphony and going. How can you bring in 
perhaps younger and, and artists from more diverse background to do other things to show the level of work you do, not just your signature piece with your artistic director. When you're here, what kind of projects can we do locally that will connect in? Um, and everyone was so excited because they kind of went, you know, this is the way we really want to work. Um, and, and indeed, as like a major European theatre company, we're saying, OK, come over, but you've got to do three productions and not just with your artistic director, who, you know, invariably is a middle aged white man. <laughs> you know, what are the other productions that you can bring, um, which gives us a, a stronger sense of your city? And what can you say about your city and our city? So it, it's a different way of, of thinking about about touring and about international presentation that we're, we're just at the beginning of. And in a weird way, it's kind of like back basically what people did in the 60s. You know, when the Berlin Ensemble would come to Edinburgh, it would sit there for the month and do three or four shows, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So, know so yeah, it, the, the tours were much more extensive than they would have been now. We've just got so used to the idea of, of narrowing things down. I mean, flights have got cheaper and there are perhaps more presenters. So, and, and, and of course, you know, there's just some very specific things about how people travel and what the kind of, what the, what the carbon kind of output of that travel is. But, but I do think that it's, it's, a, it's a big rethink for us for 22. Um, mm -hmm. And there are companies who've said, we're going to come from far away and it's okay because we've got our travel covered, so you don't have to pay for that. And we've said, well, no, because you're coming from the other side of the world for two performances and we can't live with the environmental impact of that. So, um, but it does, there is something on the one hand, it sounds like something that is, is, is giving us less, but actually the conversations become, it opens up much more interesting conversations. Yeah. That, that's true. We had the, the great David Gotthard who ran the Rivers, Riverside Studios in London when they were the Riverside Studios where all the, the Beckett's and the Hunters and uh, Silk Imaginaire and American, who said we were a home and um, and we invited also country as complicated as well so they didn't have a miserable summer in Poland, you know, because that and then they stayed and they did something and back at rehearsed um, there. So he said it was it became a home. And I think that's yeah, just thinking, make that connection when you said uh, actually that's how it was um, in the 60s in a way, you know, and they also connected an audience. He said people would have a coffee with Beckett or something like it's unimaginable, you know, for us or for me. And he said he had a harder time going perhaps to Dublin, but he accepted the idea of an old rundown film studio. Um, so um, that is a way and something is a very, very important uh, thing to touch on. I mean, I think we, yeah. we, we do need to be a little bit careful as well, because this this could become quite exclusionary as well if we're just looking, you know, because trying to bring companies from Sub-Sahara Africa or Southeast Asia, there, there, there's a lot of travel involved in that. Um, mm -hmm. And so we need to think that through. And I, I believe it is, you know, if, if, we're, if we're working sustainably very carefully about that, I think that that is incredibly important. And, you know, the local is fantastic and it's nice to bring something from London and Berlin and perhaps it mm -hmm. isn't as, you know, but we don't want to, uh, that, that being at the risk of us not hearing voices from South America or elsewhere, you know, right. who might also stay longer and, and, and have a deeper engagement and um, and open up to a festival. I know Thomas Oberander in Berlin was the festival where they did the project down to earth where they said let's have ten companies, but there no electricity, all outside, you know, and engage uh, with the uh, with the place, you know, and. What you do now also um, in the parks, I think that the walks that you, if I understand right, you take a walk in Edinburgh and you hear and you think about the streets in Cairo, you know, what happened there, which I think. You mentioned uh, Milo Rao, who I know has done yeah. one of these talks, who, who sort of said every show they do has to fit in the back of a small van, you know, in touring. So mm -hmm. you've got to think about that at the very beginning. You know, I think we've also expanded into a kind of an area of, of technical wizardry and it's wonderful but again I think all of these things need to be 
reframed in terms of why we're touring and what the impact of touring is and that we don't overcomplicate it. We're doing a project as Akram Khan next year and the whole thinking of the project from the beginning is, okay, how, how do we simplify a lot of the things that are wrong within this in terms of, you know, we've got to bring endless flight cases and huge numbers of people, but also how do we stay a little longer and, 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 and how would we involve, do we really need to tour everyone? Perhaps some people locally could do it. And if they do, what's the benefit to them and, and, um, and what's the legacy? of what's the legacy of a tour beyond somebody having a nice nice night out that's a that's a really great great question and it's gonna put us um uh, put us to think. i know you do the um, um con film also interesting you say i can also show the film or you're dancing in the streets the videos you show your often global kind of participation in your festival and and then you say then the artist comes next to your life in person and people are already you, you know a bit um, about it. As you know, perhaps, I don't know, we mentioned, we are thinking how can we create also a great summer festival in New York, perhaps. The Corona time is the World War II. America did not go uh, through that experience of bombed cities, you know, in that sense of uh, World War II. But luckily, and they were on the right side of history and did such great work. And um, But perhaps this is a moment to think about what you also said. It was a moment for people to get together, the artists, people, even if you miss all the shows, you still have that excitement, the celebration of life, of art, all what we miss now. And um, so these are important, uh, important points. What would you say, what it would make it, you have done so many great editions of festivals. What did you learn? What are the most, what are the most important lessons if one, any in the world you know we have so many listeners but we don't want to do this what do you think what do people should keep in mind i think there has to be a real why and and something beyond the the, the work itself i think that you know i in sydney it was the month it was like on vacances it was it was the celebratory month and so you know, it, it, it's an incredible feeling because that city truly just stops working. And there is just this incredible generosity of spirit that takes takes hold. And so you became the organization that was responsible for capturing that and really making it all the more wonderful. Um, as I said, in Edinburgh, it was an idea about internationalism and, and it having this, this, this great powerful kind of um, um, way of bringing people together. So I, I, I think it has to have something like that at, the, at its core. I think it has to have something, a, real, a really strong reason and a really strong idea of community. Um, because I think if, if people don't rally around the idea that's generated by a festival and feel that it's important to them, that the idea is important to them, they'll like it and it might go on for a while but it will peter out and new york has had a few goes at this mm -hmm. um i remember one in gosh it must have been the 80s there was there was the real attempt at it and i remember you know and the paycock being there from the gate theater and various other um but of course new york has a lot going on anyway so you you can't in new york sort of say you know oh my gosh for this month you're going to be able to see milo rao and Serge Mikulubile or something like that, because you're going to see them anyway. So, so it's it's finding it would be to find what it is that people really want to rally around, and what what are the values that people really want to rally around. Um, and so, it's yeah. What does what does a festival say? Um, and in Sydney, we had this expression, which was, this is our city in summer. And, you know, that, that was really it. It was, it was just to say, you know, this is what, this is, this is our moment of joy and come and celebrate it with us. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think sort of that, that, that central philosophical point. And then if that is powerful enough and there's enough buy-in, I guess you could say, by, by the community um, and that just, that's, I'm really talking about large civic festivals with that. That could be buy-in with an art form. Um, and, you know, it can be Cannes with film. It can be Venice um, with visual art. Um, 
but in each case, I still think that there's a sort of a shared sense of value and purpose around which people just feel that, you know, they can, they can identify with and they want to be part of that celebration. Mm. Yeah. No, that's, a, that's a big, big point. And maybe there's a reason that it's, we, I mean, we have under the radar, it's a bit cold in general, it's a great festival. Often artists actually are not under the radar, but uh, there's the BAM season of next week, which is great. There was the Lincoln Center Theater Festival, which for whatever reason was canceled. I don't understand why, but that big kind of a summer, enjoying the city, having artists, engaging in neighborhoods, perhaps in all five boroughs. Um, I think Under the Radar is a great, a great example, you know, because Under the Radar, even though it's a small festival, it's got a very strong sense of purpose. And, you know, that it, it for me, it represented a kind of generation of theater makers um, who were, you know, quite politically charged um, and had had a, a shared sense. I mean, not that it was sort of, you know, all the same, but, but a, a shared sense of values that they believed were going to be important for the theater. And, and that was what that gathering was, was about. And, and it, really, it really does work as a festival. Yeah, it does. And there's a, a, a great lineup. A question for you, let's say, with all your experience from Australia, you know, Ireland, and, and now in Scotland, um, and this corona, let's say, behind us, and you would have the resources that were, you know, they, what would you do if, you know, in any town, or let's say also in, in Scotland or in, in, in Australia, what, what would you do if you had to, the resources, you could do whatever you want, and what would be a vision? What would be something you could not have done right now, but where you think, I think this would work. This is something that um, I would like to try out, but we couldn't do it for whatever reasons. I mean, if I had all the time and all the money. Yes. Um, I think that the biggest vulnerability we have at the moment is around education and the arts. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, certainly in the UK, education is becoming far more based the humanities are slipping away from education um and there's there's a sort of a i think a not a pressure but you know cert certainly a, a concern that arts organizations should be addressing that more but of course arts organizations are peddling very hard at the moment just to keep up um but I think that the, the, the biggest thing that would if it could just sort of wave a magic wand, it would be a, a, an intergenerational question. It would be a question of a, a massive um, engagement of, of a younger audience, and particularly a school going audience. I'm also mm -hmm. just, you know, just right now, I just feel that 15 to 25 year olds have got it in the neck far worse than anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I know there are there are all sorts of different issues at play, um, but they are kind of you know. So if if I could do anything now and be given unlimited time and money, I would completely focus attention on on, on a younger generation and about knowledge um, and education within the arts at, at that level. I think that um, the rest of us and us kind of. And we'll sort of be able to work our way through this, mm -hmm. but that's, that's where that's where I put my my attention. And um, we'll see. Twenty two is my last festival, anyway, so mm -hmm. I'll have to be careful. Because I'll have to go do it now. No, that's that's quite a, a important, also a bit a surprising uh, stunt uh, point. Uh, I said, but I think you're absolutely uh, right. You know, all these artists who come and visit, you know, how could they engage with the schools? Uh, um, then I think you mentioned the Bernstein uh, uh, concerts for young audiences where he explained he had a curious Rebrennikov with us, the great uh, Russian director, you know, with the Gorky, what he did there, and uh, next to many other incredible things. He says the artist entrance and public entrance is all the same. There's coffee that's open all day long. Um, after each show, people go out, uh, the actors, and hang out with the audience if they go their private. Uh, things going on, but he also said, well, we have to bring these kids, the teenagers close to uh, uh, Chekhov, Shakespeare, Heinrich Müller, whatever he said, why should they? It's not their 
responsibility. What he says, traditional theater things, you know, it's like, you know, you have a beautiful Prada bag and you should come and admire it and you should buy it. And often actors, you know, when they speak the words as, as if they wear these expensive clothes and look how great we are. And, uh, you know, I hope you understand our, you no, know, it has to be different. We have to educate. We have to reach out um, as the Gorky in Berlin that has all the subtitles in, in, in this. Turkish, they said, but so why should we exclude an entire audience? Why do we think that there? And um, and so I think um, there are. But I, I, I think done. there does have to be. I do. I think also built within the education system. You know, I mean, yeah. sometimes you know, sometimes it's good to know about Chekhov, and you can say this isn't for me, but yeah. I saw it and I reject it, and I've got yeah. something better. Um, but I, I still believe it's, you know. It's not just about us doing things to lean into that audience. I think that there's something more fundamental required within the education system. And um, and I think that how how the arts would feed into that, I think, is we haven't we haven't fully worked it out. Yeah. I remember being in the in the Volksbühne about 10 years ago um, and, and the bar was just with young people and I said to them you know gosh what do you do what's your development strategy and they just said we sell the cheapest beer in town they said our beers are cheaper than anywhere else and they're yeah. kind of going it's we're just true. fundamentally fundamentally sympathetic to young people and yeah. it's, it's and 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 I think that it but the way the way organizations arts organizations are calibrated at the moment it's it's very easy to say that, but particularly I think in in North America and the UK to a degree, you know, the the way the structure of them around donors and box office and everything else makes that incredibly difficult. So there's going to have to be another another argument. And of course, when you talk about the intergenerational question, there's intersectional questions there as well, because you know certainly in the UK when you when you begin to drop down into generations, the audience becomes far more diverse as well. Um, and, and, you know, so, so it's not just about young, it's also about, you know, when we talk about diversifying the audience, I think that generational challenge is kind of at the core of that as well. Yeah, which your video actually showed that you're interested, that they are part, you want them to come. And, um, and uh, there's great outreach, I think also, the, tried out the Théâtre de la Ville in Paris. We had Emmanuel de Maximotin, who says one of his work also is how to engage with art, science, uh, artist schools, and to have a theater as a host for that. And, and as you said, it's not just us, it's a whole, it's a complex system, but actually to be had it on the mind. And still from that talk, which we had with Chile, where the sensational election happened, where uh, people who actually were protesting on the streets got elected even to rewrite the constitution, not just even the leftists, traditional political parties, and it was done by teenagers. That kind of uprising, um, not paying the subway tickets, uh, forcing uh, also others to go out on this. It were actually, they were the teenagers who did it. And our hope is that it's a great generation that's also coming out there and to connect to them and uh, to learn from them. And also, you know, say you, what you said, you know, that, that our lives are richer sharing through um, our traditions, but with new, perhaps also technological um, discoveries. And you, you are doing that. So it's a, a quite a stunning um, um, uh, to hear from you how different it is and how brave it is and all the difficulties. But still, it sounds a bit like Wonderland to us here in the New York, you know, that what you are wrestling with, I think many uh, people would love to, to be wrestling with. And this, what you show that new structure that you are building, but it's something also, it's a representation of something that is changing. You are building a new structure for that courtyard and that I think the uh, junior school, um, but still it's also something new is happening and we are so close to as we might not be seeing it, but you are part of that change. And uh, so it was really important. And I mean, great the, the, other, the other thing I guess in all of this as well is, you know, I'm incredibly privileged in terms of what I do. There's, there's also the question you sort of say, as I begin to think about, you know, what, what I would do. I, I think that roles like mine are possibly becoming outdated as well. 
um, the idea of the festival director who makes a selection of work and therefore everyone goes, oh, well, this must be important work because the festival director said it. Um, and, you know, I think one of the best things that people like me are probably going to have to do is, is kind of get out of the way. Um, you mean and, like more an ensemble or it's more, um, or more grassroots? Or yeah, what's the I alternative? Mean, well, I mean, certainly bringing people through. Um, I think you know, I, I, and 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 certainly certainly a plurality of voices in terms of curation, um, which is more complex, certainly. Um, but I I do think that the idea of of the figurehead artistic director, you know, I, I'm not I'm not sure in in the kind of the direction we're going in that it creates enough space for people to come through um, and the, the requirements of, of a particular kind of, you know, life led um, means it's sort of, you know, our idea of an artistic director becomes a little mm. bit exclusionary, I fear at times. Um, and it leads to, you know, a very kind of a linear hierarchical situ sort of uh, situation. So when you're really busy doing all of this, you know, trying to get the work up, it's hard to kind of think about this, but um, I do, and you can see it breaking down a little bit. You can see mm -hmm. it starting to people to find other other models and other ways of doing it. And you do need structures. I'm not saying it can be anarchy, mm -hmm. but you know, I I I would wonder about just you know if if I was starting a festival completely from scratch now, whether I would build it in the sort of conventional sense of the way at the moment that uh, you know i mean cer certainly an organization like holland festival has really mixed it up um where they have guest curators and they've got a fixed administration now that's not going to work for everyone but i i think that the notion of artistic directorate and curation in the performing art is going to if not be challenged certainly become um more nuanced in the next few years yeah that's, a, that's quite an important um, observation. As we observe it in theater companies, and um, Florian Malzacker writes about it, the German curator, and he says, you know, now we have two or three people sharing directing credits. Uh, companies are one part is in Japan, and the other in Germany, sometimes they're here or there. Um, we don't have the one. The Peter Brooks are, of directors are also kind of, you know, no longer there. And it's a big loss on one hand. On the other hand, there's also these kind of shared responsibilities come in the form of ensembles that, you know, but also communities or projects or places, the in place, the uh, locatedness, um, you know, as uh, we just talked about here in, in one of the dissertation utensils with Jay Booker. So th that this comes into play. And I think that is true that also it should be reflected what we want in life and our political social goals are, our state goals has to be represented also in the way we produce work in companies as artists, but I guess also in festival. And that's a very, very good point. And um, maybe it will be, um, will be better for it. It will certainly be different. So really, thank you so much for, for sharing. This was so, um, so uh, inspiring to hear from you and a great update. Also optimistic, I would say, in a way, that as things are going on, things will go on change and um, that anything that is constant is the change but we have real change and uh, the continental plates have moved a bit of theater and we have to see how much and how not and what what will come out of it but I think this helped us to understand it and give great meaning for us and uh, our time to really really thank you for taking this so serious this talk uh, I know how much you do and how much you work so it's a big uh, big honor to have you with us and um, Tomorrow we, we, we go on with our uh, talks. We're going to have the great Emily Mann, who ran for 30 years the uh, MacArthur Theatre in Princeton, and one of the great, great artistic leaders in the United States as a director who worked with the actors, but also worked on documentary theatre, theatre of the real, which became so much more important. We had Carol Martin just last week. Who, she will be with us, and we will talk about this uh, entrance of the real on stages, like uh, what you said, you know, you put on a headset and you hear something of the streets of Cairo while you stroll through Edinburgh, kind of in a documentary way, also like new forms, and it has become something, signs of our uh, time. And then we're going to have two curators 
from Berlin, and they also come from around the world. Joanna Warszawa from Poland, um, and her uh, colleague, uh, this Turkish German, Obu Yomu Gusulu, they created the Balcony Project Artists in Prenzlauer Berg neighborhood, did uh, two festivals now where they presented work from their balconies during quarantine, during the lockdown. Highly successful, uh, beloved, uh, and we're going to hear um, what they did, and is that something, you know, that will come into the next Berlin Festival or not? Who knows, you know, that like these things which were unthinkable that great artists who happen to live in Berlin show work on their tiny balconies, and people say, this is so great, I'm so glad they did that. So who would have thought that? Um, again, thank you so much. I hope you will stay in contact with upcomers for visits, and I hope to visit the Edinburgh Festival um, um, also, and um, and uh, when it's uh, running again, when it's up and to people, yeah, this is a great, a great place of theater where theater and performance make a difference. It's a great town, Edinburgh, Scotland, and uh, it's on the map also because of that. So um, uh, uh, once in your life, as in, in some other religions, you have to be once in Jerusalem or once go to Mecca, at least once you have to go uh, to Edinburgh Festival to understand what theater is, and I hope everybody will do that. And Fergus gave us so many reasons, and his team, of course, that put this together. And it's a big honor that you opened, uh, uh, that you published it today. It was probably is a coincidence, but we, of course, are happy that the Siegel Talk was connected to, the, uh, to that, that you went out today public. And uh, congratulations on everything you have done. And of course, we are really sorrow that, feel sorry that you had to spend so much time there in your room we didn't talk so much about how you experienced it but i think that festival um is just uh, that's coming up so important that we focused on that so um talk to you soon to our listeners really thank you for taking the time listen to voices from europe uh, from the admiral festival and it is important it is significant but ultimately only significant if it's for you the ones who listen so that it means something to you and also, the idea that as Fergus reinvents the festival, rethinks about gathering, getting together, so how do we do that in our lives? And art has to inspire us and enter our lives. And there's no separation between art and life. Whatever he said also applies to, to our situations, wherever we are, and um, professionally, but also in a private way. So that is important. And thanks to HowlRound for being such a great host, Thea, BJ, Andy from the Siegel Center. And uh, talk to you soon. We talked a little bit more than we said than the hour, but it was time well spent, at least for me. And I hope it was at least a little bit inspiring, hopefully as much as it was for us. Bye-bye, Fergus. Thank you. Thanks so much, Frank. Bye-bye.